Uh, so this is part of the Back to Basics track. I hope you're all enjoying the Back to Basics track, and I hope that you are rating the talks uh, through the feedback site. If you're not, please do. You know, please tell us if they're good, if they're bad, what we can do to improve, um, and we'll get better next year. All right, so welcome to Lambdas from Scratch. I'm Arthur O'Dwyer, and uh, raise your hand if you've seen this talk before, a talk with this title, or Generic Lambdas from First Principles. I don't see any hands. I don't see any people. That's terrible. All right. Um, but if you are raising your hand, then uh, know that this will be very similar material to what you saw in those previous talks. This talk has been presented here before. Um, I've updated it a bit for what's coming, what is here now in C++ 17, and what's coming in uh, 20. Um, but the bulk of it, the, the outline, is going to be the same. So originally I called this talk uh, Lambdas from First Principles um, before I got onto my whole from scratch uh, kick. Uh, and the reason that I call it from first principles is that we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start with C and with functions. Um, so C++ also has functions, but it got them from C. The structure of a C++ function looks just like a C function. Um, it's very old technology. We have a function here, its name is plus one, it takes an int and returns an int, and its behavior is that it adds one and, and uh, returns x plus one. The compiler can take this and compile it down into some machine code. I'm gonna be showing machine code, or uh, I should say assembly code alongside here, and if you can follow along in Godbolt if you want, type in the code, see what it produces uh, on the right-hand side. So, functions are easy. Now, C++ added some more things in that general function space. Um, the first thing C++ added was function overloading. The ability to have two different functions, both named plus one, but to, in a sense, have a little bit of polymorphism, right? Static polymorphism, but polymorphism nonetheless, because I can now say plus one of y, and I don't have to care, as the human programmer, what type y is. If it's an int, uh, then the compiler will call plus one of int. If it's a double, the compiler will call plus one of double, and of course there's overload resolution that helps us figure out which overload to call. Um, so we have function overloading. But we have two functions now, and they are both named plus one. Um, how does the linker know that these are two distinct functions? Well, the way that C++ decided to do it is to mangle the names of the arguments into the linker symbol that represents the function. So over on the right-hand side here, we see the code generation again, and we see we, t we have two plus one functions, but one of them, the mangled name, contains an I for int, and in the other case, it contains a D for double, and they have very different code inside themselves, right, because adding uh, one to an int is a different operation at the machine level than adding one to a double, even though in the source code they look the same. So C++ gives us this tool. However, in this case, we still had to write out the body twice, and the body is the same in both cases. Return x plus one. I have to write a, diff a different version of plus one, a different overload for int, for short, for double, for any other type that I want. There are a lot of types. I would like to automate this away. I would like to have a template for stamping out functions of that form when the body's always the same or just parameterized a little bit. In this case, the only parameter, um, the only thing I'm changing about these various overloads is what type they take and what type they return. And that's always the same type. I'll just call that type T and I'll make a template, a function template. Now, a function template is not a function. It's a template for stamping out functions. Right? You put in a T, you get a function. So. In that case, notice, again, that the compiler is doing something a little bit different on the right-hand side. The uh, template instantiations it's producing don't have mangled names that look quite the same as if it were a simple function that was overloaded with different signatures. That is, multiple functions all in the same overload set. When I have a function template, the mangled names look a little bit different again, but we see that we have the i and the d showing up again. So now when I say auto y equals plus one of 42, the compiler uses template type deduction and it figures out that 42 is an int. Which plus one should I call? Well, I have a template for stamping out functions, so I can put in whatever t I want. What should t be? It does template type deduction. It deduces that t should be int, and it instantiates plus one of int. For plus one of 3.14, it'll instantiate uh, plus one of double. 
and it will stamp out the code on the right. C++ also gave us the ability to put functions inside classes. I, they're called member functions, right? I can have a class member function. Here I have a class capital P plus, and it has a data member named value of type int. It has a constructor, which will say uh, takes this V and uh, initializes value with V, not shown. And then we have a member function, plus me. It takes an int and returns an int. It also takes that hidden this parameter so that it can access the data members of the class capital P plus. And it's a const member function. I don't have to modify the class capital P plus object itself. I don't have to modify star this inside this function. I'm just reading it. So I make it a const member function. And this generates, yet again, a little bit different code. So C++ gave us class member functions. Now C++ also, oh, nope, we're not there yet. I'm sorry. Which function do we call? When I have an object of type capital P plus, so plus of one, and I put that in a variable, named variable, named lowercase plus, and I say plus dot plus me of 42, how does the computer know that I intend to call the plus me method of the capital P plus class? How does it know that I want to call that plus me function and not some other plus me function? Well, that's static typing, right? C++ is not Java. In Java, it would look something like this. I have a variable in my function uh, stack frame, and it is a reference to an object that lives out on the heap, right? Java has object types. Many languages work this way, JavaScript, Python. Um, and out there on the heap, I have this object, and it has a table of behaviors. The object knows about its various behaviors, so it has a, what we call a v-pointer to a v-table, and the v-table has function pointers to these various behaviors. And if you want to know what does the plus object do when you say plus me on it, you ask the plus me, you ask the plus object. You follow the pointer to the object, I should use my mouse pointer, you follow the pointer to the object, you follow the v-pointer to the table of behaviors, you follow the function pointer to the actual behavior. Uh, C++ lets you do this, but this is not the default. This is very inefficient. We don't want to do this. The C++ approach is we take the object and we put it right there on the stack, in the stack frame. When I declare an object whose type is capital P plus, I get an actual capital P plus object right there on the stack, the same as if I had declared an int. C++ treats these types the same as the fundamental types. When I declare a std string, I get a std string right there on the stack. It may manage a heap allocation as part of what it does, but the object itself, I have size of that object type bytes right there on the stack. And there are no pointers. We got rid of all the pointers, not just the pointer to the heap allocation, we got rid of the V pointer. The, there's no V pointer, there's no V table, there's no table of behaviors in C++ unless you explicitly ask for one by making one or more of your methods virtual. Instead, the compiler knows that when you call the plus me method on an object whose static type is capital P plus, you must mean the plus me method that is a member of capital P plus. So I've indicated that with just a little dotted line here. Static typing for the win. A little dotted line. Um, and there are no pointer dereferences showing up in the generated code. The generated code uh, simply calls the constructor of plus and then it calls the plus me method of plus. The compiler knows the names of those functions and it knows what they do and it can inline them even. I had to turn off inlining to get it to generate this code. So class member functions look like this. C++ also gives us something else. The other thing C++ gives us is operator overloading. I can overload the plus operator. I can overload the times operator. I can overload the function call operator. The function call operator is spelled operator paren paren. And when I do that, I no longer call that member function by saying plus dot plus me and passing arguments. I just say plus open parenthesis and pass some arguments. This is what happens when you have an overloaded operator paren paren. So I can call it like we see down in the lower right hand corner here. I make my capital P plus object constructed with the integer one. I assign that to a variable, lowercase plus, and then I use that variable, the lowercase plus, and I call it like a function that calls the overloaded call operator. And the call operator can do whatever I want. And it's still marked const because I still don't need to modify the object in order to call its call operator. So now we can make something kind of nifty. You may have noticed on this slide, there's a lot of boilerplate. Everything in green 
is basically boilerplate. It, it's not relevant to the task I'm trying to accomplish. Everything in bold and red, that is the irreducible complexity of this code. If, if I want to accomplish this task that I've set out to accomplish, I'm going to need uh, something that uh, holds within itself int value, and as a data member named value, it's a type int, the compiler isn't gonna figure that out for me, I had to type that out. Uh, it has uh, something that takes an int, returns an int, returns x plus value. But everything else, everything in green is boilerplate, and we can just get rid of that. We're gonna get rid of all of that green text, and we're gonna replace it with uh, braces. Braces and brackets and parentheses, one of each. That's right. Um, so, this is a lambda. This means the exact same thing as what we had on the previous slide. And it's used exactly the same way. Okay. On the previous slide, I had a class capital P plus, and it had a data member named value uh, that was initialized in the constructor, and it had an operator friend friend that did this and was const. On the next slide, I still have a variable but it's no longer a capital P plus variable because that name was part of my reducible complexity. I got rid of it. I don't need to, rec to uh, remember that name. That name is not important. The lambda is still a variable of class type or an object of class type that I'm assigning to a variable and that lowercase plus object is still conceptually an object of type capital P plus but its name has gone away. The compiler is gonna pick a name for it and it's gonna pick something that I can't spell other than through taking the decal type of that object. It has the exact same implementation. Uh, plus is now an object, it's not a capital P plus object, we're gonna say it's a dollar sign zero object because that's what Clang does. Um, and it has that same sort of static uh, relationship with the code for the call operator. And the code looks exactly the same. So we haven't lost anything at all by getting rid of that name capital P plus. So this gives us the ability to have Lisp-style, Python-style closures without introducing heap allocation, garbage collection, uh, runtime polymorphism. We didn't do any of that, right? We just took a very simple class capital P plus and we got rid of its name and we gave you some syntactic sugar. That's all Lambda is. So how does this interact with uh, capturing things? Well, here I have a function uh, contains title, it takes a reference to a shelf full of books, and it takes a uh, title of one of those books as a std string. I could have passed it by reference, I decided in, in this slide I'm not going to. And I make a lambda. My lambda has one data member named T, lowercase t. Uh, that data member is initialized when I construct my lambda, which is happening right here, I initialize it with a copy of title. It has an operator print print that takes a reference to a const book and asks that book for its title and compares that to the captured uh, data member T. And then I can pass that lambda off to uh, find if, right? I can pass that lambda around just like a regular object, just like an object of class type, because that's what it is. It's an object of class type. I just can't name what type it is exactly. So how that would look is here I have my parameter title it lives on the stack, it maybe manages some heap allocation out there on the heap, right, the, the, uh, the contents of the string. And when I make my lambda and I make a copy of it into that data member, the std string data member named lowercase t of that object, that's just calling the copy constructor. So here's my has title t object, it's of type dollar sign one, I can't name what type it is, but the compiler gave it a type. I can't spell what type it is, I should say. And that has a data member of type std string named t initialized with a copy of the string. Uh, you can think about this when you're looking at the capture list. Think about putting an auto on front. You don't actually put the auto in the front, but that's essentially a, a good enough way to think about what the syntax is doing. If I say auto t equals title, that makes a copy of the string that calls the copy constructor. So likewise, when I have in square brackets for a lambda, t equals title, the lambda is capturing a copy of the string, it's calling the copy constructor. What if I didn't want to make that copy? Well, I could capture a pointer, right? How would I capture a pointer? Well, if I said auto pt equals the address of title, that would give me a variable of type 
uh, std string star, a pointer to a std string. Uh, so I can just remove the auto and put brackets around it, and now I've captured a pointer to a string. But that looks a little different. You know, I have to dereference the pointer uh, in here. So we can do a little bit better. We also have added syntactic sugar for lambdas in C++ 11. That I can do this. When I say auto ampersand t equals title, that means t is a reference to title. I didn't make a copy. t is a reference. So likewise, I can drop the auto and put the square brackets in my lambda. When I have a lambda where in the square brackets I say ampersand t equals title, that means t is a reference to the title from the outer scope to that title variable. And so it would look something like this. Notice my lambda is getting smaller. I'm not copying the string object anymore, that 24, 32 bytes of, of string. I'm just calling a, an eight byte reference to the title. But when we capture by reference, uh, we do have to be a little bit careful because that reference might become dangling. If, if I capture a reference to a local variable and then I return that lambda, then the returned lambda will have within itself a reference that refers to the title object, the local variable or the parameter of my function, which has now returned. That object has been destroyed. I have a dangling reference. So if you're going to be making lambdas that you're going to be passing up the call stack or across into another thread, um, not passing down into a standard algorithm like std sort, that's fine, capture by reference, but if you're passing them up, returning them, or uh, passing them across to a different thread, you want to be careful about dangling references when you do this. Can we capture it by move? So when I say t equals title, that copies title. That calls the copy constructor uh, to copy title into the t data member of the lambda's captured state, right, into the closure object. What if we wanted not to call the copy constructor and make a second copy of the heap allocation, but instead move it in? There is no shorthand for that but we don't need shorthand. If I say auto t equals std move of title, that creates a std string t and calls the move constructor to initialize it. So we just drop the auto again and we get something like this, t equals std move of title. That's how I would move a local variable into a lambda and then I would not want to use the uh, local variable again after that. So in that case, t is pilfering the pointer, stealing the guts from title. Title becomes empty or goes into a valid but unspecified state. Uh, T now gets its contents and we didn't do an extra heap allocation there, we just used the move constructor. So there are many redundant shorthands for how to capture things. The one I've been showing, the two I've been showing, number one, T equals title, just think of that, about that as putting auto on the front. You can also say ref t equals title, but just think about it as like putting auto on the front. There are also these couple of shorthands that actually came in earlier. In C++ 11, these shorthands were all we had. You just say title. You name the variable in the outer scope. And this is roughly equivalent to saying title equals title, right? Capturing a uh, data member whose name is title, whose type is the same as the title from the outer scope. So it's similar to title equals title. There are some little fiddly things going on here with array decay, things going on with decal type or how you use it in a const expert. Um, they usually don't matter. That's why it's a shorthand. It's, it is syntactic sugar. Uh, still, for teaching purposes, I find that explaining it this way, just stick the auto on the front, that's, that's the best way to, to communicate what is actually going on in this case. You can also use a very short shorthand to capture only what is needed. So if I put a single equals sign inside the square brackets and nothing else, uh, that means capture only what is needed. Look to see what is used in the body of the lambda and anything that you don't recognize, anything that's not a parameter to the lambda, a local variable of the lambda, uh, look it up in the outer scope and if you find that it's a local variable with the outer scope, capture that. You can also say I capture only what I need, only what I use, but by reference, I capture references to all of those things. This is the most useful and most common kind of lambda, the kind of lambda that says I capture everything I need by reference. 
this is the kind of lambda that I'm going to make when I pass things down into standard algorithms, std sort, std find def. Because I'm passing them down, it's safe to capture by reference. And uh, I don't want to write out everything. I, I just want to keep it nice and short. There's a little caveat here. Globals and statics are not captured, neither are unevaluated operands, um, because they are not needed. Uh, the address of a global doesn't change. To illustrate this, I'm going to show a little puzzle. Unfortunately, I'm not going to ask for hands. Uh, I'm just going to give you the answer. But here I have a main function, uh, a program, and I've got global int g equals 10. I then make two lambdas. I make kitten and cat. They both return g plus 1. The cat says, I capture a data member whose name is g, whose type is the same as that outer g, as if I had written auto g equals g. And it's a copy of g. The kitten says, I capture everything I need. Then in main, I change the value of g from 10 to 20, and I ask the kitten and the cat for their results. What I see is different results. I see 21 and 11. The cat has captured a copy of g. So it captured a copy of 10. It initialized its uh, data member to 10. And so it's returning 10 plus 1, which is 11. The kitten, on the other hand, said I capture everything I need. And it doesn't need a copy of g. g is always available. It's global. There is only one g. It's over there. Kitten knows how to get to it when it needs it. And it doesn't need it until you call operator pren pren, at which point it goes and looks at the value of g, and it sees that it's 20, and it adds 1 to it, and you get 21. So there is a subtle difference between saying capture everything I need and explicitly saying I would like a copy of this variable whether I need it or not. There are some other features of lambdas uh, that are interesting, that are useful. One is that if I have a lambda which doesn't capture anything, which just has empty square brackets, these are also useful because they are convertible to raw function pointers. I can take one of these lambdas and I can implicitly convert it to the type of its operator pren pren. Well, more or less. Its operator pren pren is really a member function, right? So it doesn't have that type. But I can take the lambda and convert it to a pointer to a function that takes an int and returns an int. This is a handy way to define C style functions in line. Uh, and this is a very common idiom in some kinds of C code. We're actually going to see this being very important in my talk after lunch on type erasure from scratch, which will be 1.30 p.m. over there in Aurora A. Another idiom you might see is that if I have one of these lambdas and I put a unary plus in front of it, the unary plus is like the counterpart of unary minus. Unary minus says negate the thing. Unary plus says don't negate the thing. It's not a very useful operator, but what it does do is, is it only works on scalar types, on, on arithmetic types, on pointer types. It doesn't work uh, on class types. And so when the compiler sees that you're trying to use it on this lambda type, which doesn't have an operator plus defined, it says, OK, I'm going to look for implicit conversions from this to something with an operator plus. And what it finds is that conversion to, uh, to the function pointer type. So it converts it to a function pointer type and then doesn't negate it. And so the result is that this call down here calls fn instantiated with a function pointer type rather than with the lambda type itself. And so this can save on template instantiations. And we'll see more uses of that after lunch. Lambdas are also, uh, well, they will be default constructible. If I have a captureless lambda, then in C20, this is a, a new change to enable uh, even better metaprogramming and, and uh, things of that nature. If I have a lambda that all it does is add 1 to x, I will be able to say, get me the type of that lambda. Right? I can't spell that type. It's spelled like dollar sign zero, dollar sign 52. I don't know how it's spelled. But I can say decal type of lamb, and that will give me the type. Uh, declare a variable of that type and default initialize it. When I default initialize a captureless lambda in C20, I will actually get uh, an, an instance of that lambda type. Right? It doesn't have any captures. There's nothing to copy. So it's fine to default initialize it. So that's coming. So that may be useful. Um, lambdas are also constexpr by default in C17. 
so I can actually use them inside static asserts. Here, I didn't make lamb a const expr variable, and I didn't have to write the word const expr anywhere inside it. The compiler just made it const expr by default because it could be const expr. If it tried to do something like throw, uh, I believe it would not be const expr. But the compiler can see that it's only doing const expr things, and it will make it callable in const expr context like this. However, the compiler will not make it no accept. Even though it can see that this won't throw, the call operator will not be marked no accept by default. If you want it to be no accept, you can put no accept in the usual place right here after the closing parenthesis. You can say oh, this lambda's call operator is no accept for some reason. Um, generally, you don't have to do that. If you were just in uh, Ben Sachs' talk uh, in this room before, I think he talked a little bit about no accept. And generally, you're not going to need that. But in special cases, you can put it in. Lambdas can also have uh, local state. I can have a lambda that, that counts, but maybe not in the way that you think. I see that people sometimes will write code something like this. Counter is a lambda. It has an operator friend friend that doesn't take any arguments, and it returns an int. We can tell that, by the way, because of the type of the return statement. You don't have to write the uh, return type, although you can. You can put a trailing return type right here and say arrow int if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, so just like in a function, right? I have a function local static. I'll make a lambda local static. Static int i return plus plus i. And then I make a couple of counters. It's just the class type. I can copy it. And then I start incrementing the one counter. And then after a while, I start incrementing the other counter. And I find that they share the same state. I get one, two, three, and then four, five, six from the second counter. That's a little weird. If I had two functions, one named C1 and one named C2, and they each had a static int i inside themselves, C1's i and C2's i would be different. But if I have two instances of the same lambda type, then that static int i is actually a static function local variable inside the definition of operator paren paren for that lambda type. That's a single function. There is a single static int i. All instances of the lambda type share that same operator and share that same static. So I see people trying to use static inside lambdas. Be careful, it may not do what you want. What did we want? Well, this is what we had. Right? Static int i, there's one i, c1 and c2 both refer to it. What we really wanted was for c1 to have its own counter and for c2 to have its own counter. We already know how to do that, though. These are just class objects. If I want an object, an instance of a class, to have certain state, I put that as a data member. And how do I define a data member of a lambda? I put it in the square brackets. This lambda type, well, this lambda has a data member named i initialized with zero, and what it does is increment its own i, its own data member i. So now we have two independent i's. Unfortunately, when we try to compile this, we get a compiler error. And I'm showing you both GCC's error and Clang's error to point out that Clang's error is better. GCC says error, increment of read-only variable i. This is weird because we didn't say const anywhere. Clang says cannot assign to a variable captured by copy in a non-mutable lambda, uh, which is more helpful but also more jargon. What does it mean captured by copy in a non-mutable lambda? Well, we didn't write const anywhere, but remember how I was emphasizing earlier that the operator paren paren is always const because we don't need to modify the object in order to call it? Well, the compiler is doing that for us. In a lambda, I don't write const, but operator paren paren becomes const anyway, by default, because that is sort of a sensible default. It should be const. Unfortunately, in this case, I actually don't want a const operator paren paren. I actually do want to modify it. I want to modify this object from within operator paren paren so it can't be const. So how do I remove the const from an operator paren paren where I didn't write const in the first place? I have to come up with some word that means like negative const, right? Minus one const. And in C++, that word is mutable. So for lambdas only, I can stick the word mutable right there where I would normally stick the word const on a member function, right? Same place I would stick no except. Um, and this negates the implicit const. 
So mutable doesn't actually change whether the data members themselves are const. They're usually not const. I here was, wasn't const to begin with. Uh, but the mutable negates the const qualification of the lambda types operator paren paren. By default, they're always const. Adding mutable makes it non-const. That means that you can't say, I want to modify this data member, but not that data member. It's all or nothing, because it's not modifying the constness of the data members, it's modifying the constness of the call operator. Let's talk about something else. Generic lambdas. C++, remember, remember this slide? We're gonna combine two features. C++ gives us member functions, like capital plus colon colon plus me, it also gave us templates. We can combine these together and we can use member function templates. So plus me in this case is not a member function. It is a template for stamping out member functions. And when I have an object of type capital P plus here, I have my lowercase plus instance and I can call dot plus me of 42. That will do template type deduction, decide that it needs to stamp out a copy of the plus me member function that takes an int. Uh, plus me of 3.14, stamps out one that takes a double. And then I can combine this with operator overloading. I can change the name of the template from plus me to operator pren pren. That's a call operator. That changes how it's called. I no longer have to write dot plus me. I just open parenthesis and I put the argument. Template type deduction kicks in and decides it needs to stamp out a copy of operator pren pren that takes an int, a, co a copy that takes a double. So now we can make something kind of nifty. We can take all the stuff in green, including the little bit of template, and we can collapse it all down and replace it with one pair of every kind of brackets, and we get something called a generic lambda. Notice that our template parameter t has disappeared. Our uh, template head, template type name t, has disappeared, and instead, I'm just writing the word auto. This is special syntactic sugar, right? This is not necessarily obvious but auto has something to do with type deduction, type inference. So here, when I write auto in the parentheses, it's not the same auto that you would see somewhere else. The compiler is not going to deduce the type of this auto right here, right now. This is just a shorthand indicating that this lambda's call operator that takes an argument named x is actually a template, and it will do deduction to figure out what the type of x should be when it needs to which is when we call the call operator. When I have this object, oops, and I call its call operator, and I know you can't see that because my mouse got too close to the bottom of this, ah, all right. Um, so I call its call operator, I say plus of 42, I pass 42 to operator pren pren, the compiler says 42 is an int, therefore t must be an int, the type of x must be an int, and it will deduce at that point. Plus itself is not a template. Lowercase plus here is a variable. It's a variable of class type. What type? Well, we can't name it, but it's the equivalent of that capital P plus from the previous slide, right? I can make instances of that class. They are in no way templates. They just happen to have one member function template as a member of the class. So generic lambdas are just templates under the hood, class type with a member function template. And you can do all the stuff with that that you could do with uh, function templates. I can have variadic function templates. Here I have a variadic operator, paren paren. So this is a plus object that I can call with any kinds of arguments, and it will just add them all up. Right? Variadic lambdas can reduce boilerplate. I take my capital P plus that looks like this. The irreducible complexity is in red. I collapse it all down, replace it with one pair of braces each. Right? This is valid C++ uh, 14. Uh, it's only 14 because I'm using this longhand syntax to initialize value here. Um, you can do the same thing in 11. And now I have this object, uh, lowercase plus, that I can call just like it were a variadic uh, function template. I can give it any arguments at all, and the compiler will statically know that it needs to instantiate the operator paren paren of that dollar sign zero class, and it knows the argument types, and it will go stamp out a copy that does the right thing. So some other lambda trivia that I think is important to know if you're gonna be working a lot with lambdas. Number one, what does the this keyword mean inside a lambda? So remember it has title T here. It captures a std string, it has a data member named T, 
and inside the lambda, I'm using that data member T. Now inside a member function, I told you this was an operator friend friend member function. It is. Inside a member function, normally when I refer to a data member, such as T, I can also access it explicitly by saying this arrow T. So you might think that it would work the same way in a lambda. That might be the intuitive thing. Um, but that is not actually how it works. A, a lambda is syntactic sugar for one of these classes, cap, uh, capital P plus dollar sign zero. But part of the syntactic sugar is that this means something different because at the source level, we usually want the this keyword to expose something different from the lambda object itself because lambdas are always used in some context, in, the, in some larger context, such as this class widget. Here I have class widget. It has a function that goes and does some work, and then it has two public interfaces to doing that work. It has one that is synchronous. When you call synchronous foo with an int x, it calls uh, this arrow work of x. It has an asynchronous foo that takes x, and that's going to package up the operation of doing this arrow work of x in a lambda, and it's going to fire it off to some other thread. If the this keyword inside a lambda meant the lambda object itself and not the widget, this wouldn't compile, right? And we really do want this to compile. I don't want to have to think when I'm refactoring my code, oh, I'm adding a lambda scope, I better go audit everything I just put inside the scope and, and change all the this is to some other thing. I just want this to work. And so, starting in C++ 11, when lambdas came in as part of the design, part of the design was, this doesn't mean the lambda object, it means whatever the keyword this means in that outer scope. So if I use a lambda inside a member function of class widget, this refers to a widget. And if I use a lambda in main, where this would be a syntax error, an ill-formed uh, program, then it will be a syntax error or an ill-formed program to put it inside a lambda inside main. So it's good that these two this expressions mean the same thing. It means we can reuse code snippets without counting the brackets so carefully. There are lots of ways of capturing this, just like there are lots of ways of capturing local uh, variables. So the simplest way, and actually the way I showed on the previous slide, was to say I capture everything that I need by value. That will also capture this if this is used inside the lambda. Uh, this might also be used implicitly, by the way. When I wrote this error work, uh, since work was a member function of widget, I could have actually left off the this arrow. That would be an implicit use of, of this, and it would have to capture the this pointer. So let's see. So that, so that the, the capture by value, when that captures by value everything it needs, and one of the things it needs is the this pointer, it will capture the this pointer by value. This is often surprising because the this pointer is a pointer. It's not a widget object. This does not make a copy of the widget object. This just captures a pointer by value. So this is surprising. People didn't really like this, and so that particular syntax, the, uh, the fact that when I say I want everything by value and then you use this, that will become deprecated in C++20 with the hope to remove it later. Uh, if you want to access this because it has pointer semantics, uh, you should capture it explicitly, which you can do, such as on the next line. I can say I'm capturing explicitly this. And I should mention you can also mix and match these. I could say I'm capturing this comma ampersand, this comma equals, this comma x comma y. You know, I can mix these syntaxes inside that capture list. So I can explicitly capture this. That's a little bit of a special case. I can still say I capture everything I need by reference. That will also capture the this pointer if it is needed. Uh, and that syntax is not being deprecated. Nobody is surprised that when I capture everything I need by reference, what I get is a pointer to the object. I don't actually capture the widget object itself. This will continue to work. This is the best. You should always use this. If you use this, you will never use that deprecated syntax either. New in C++17, you can capture star this. This is not something you can do with any other expression. I can't capture star p for any arbitrary p. But specifically for star this, 
That is special syntax that means I capture a copy of the widget object itself. It's equivalent to uh, having a local variable of that type initialized with a copy of star this. Uh, capturing this by move has no shorthand equivalent. Again, you can just write it out longhand. That says if I put the keyword auto in front of that, I would have auto ob just did move of star this. That means move myself into that variable. That's also not something you, that I would expect to see in a lot of code because it's moving out of the object whose member I'm currently evaluating and executing. So another question that might come up, if you're using generic lambdas, remember we took all the t's away. We didn't have t anymore, we just had um, auto. So how do I name that parameter type t inside the body of the generic lambda if I need to? Uh, so here I have, well here I have a variadic generic lambda. I have my generic lambda plus. Its operator paren paren takes a variadic list of arguments of some type t's. Uh, but I didn't say t, and it passes them all along by copy to this function sum. Well, we don't know how sum takes, maybe it's by reference, but it doesn't do any special forwarding. On the other hand, if I tried to write perfect forwarding, which you learned about in some of the other Back to Basics talks this week, I take auto ref ref. Remember, I'm replacing t with auto here. So this is a forwarding reference. It's a pack of forwarding references because I made this generic, for, or I made this variadic for no particular reason. But here I'm taking something of deduced type ref ref. So this is a forwarding reference. So now I have all these forwarding references and I would like to forward them on to the product function. What do I write inside these angle brackets to std forward? Normally this is where I would write t or arg or whatever the name of the parameter type was. How do I name that type? since it doesn't have a name. So there are at least two possible solutions. Number one, how do I name the type of args? Well, I use decl type. Decl type of args, and I pass that as the template parameter to std forward. This works fine, you can do this. In C++20, we will also gain the ability to put the fourth type of brackets. Now you can really say you have one of every kind of brackets in your lambdas. Square brackets, angle brackets, round parens, curly braces, they're all there. Now it's a party. Um, so I can actually say explicitly, just like I would in a template header, I can say I'm taking template parameters of type t's, and then I can use t's inside. And again, I made this all variadic for no reason. You can do the same thing with non-variadic generic lambdas as well. So that's coming, that's new in C++20. So another question I get about lambdas is, so are lambdas kind of like std function? Right? They both came in in C++11, std function allows me to pass around, like I, I pass a lambda to a function that expects a std function, it's happy with that. Um, why do we have both? What's the difference? And I'm going to defer that answer. If you have that question, I strongly encourage you to come to my next talk, Type Erasure from Scratch, which will be over there. You'll be glad you went to this one. But it answers the question, std function answers the question, how do I write functions that accept lambdas as arguments? One way to pass lambdas around, the STL way, the reason that lambdas fit so well into the older versions of C++ with, with uh, the STL, you know, you can pass a lambda to std sort. The reason that worked so well is that the STL was already designed to make that work well. Um, the STL is designed as a bunch of generic algorithms, function templates. Those function templates take uh, an arbitrary comparator, an arbitrary callback, an arbitrary predicate. So I can do that. I can copy what the STL does if I want to pass around these lambdas. So I have my shelf here. It has a member function for each book, but it's not a member function. It's a member function template. It's a template for stamping out member functions, each of which will be named for each book but it'll take whatever type the user passes in. If the user passes in lambda type $0, the compiler will stamp out a new member function called for each book that takes dollar sign zero. When the, when the user passes in a different lambda type, it'll stamp out a different instantiation of this template. And for each one, this call right here, where I'm calling the call operator of that user type, 
the compiler knows statically, okay, I'm calling the call operator of that type, and it will generate the code, and it will be able to inline it. And this will get great code gen, just a whole lot of it if you use a lot of different Lambda types. Okay. So here I'm calling for each book. I'm passing in a Lambda type. Let's say this Lambda type is dollar sign one. What's gonna happen is the compiler is gonna stamp out a copy of for each book, instantiate it with uh, the template parameter func, you know, with func equals dollar sign one. And then here, it's going to call the operator paren paren of that lambda. So that means that this template definition, uh, the definition of for each book where it has the call to that operator, that had better be visible in the same translation unit, in the same source file, as the definition of the what the call operator does, right? There's no way to pass that lambda object across from one object file to another using this method. That's why we always declare templates in header files, right? So alternatively, if you wanted to pass a lambda across an ABI boundary from one object file to another object file, uh, you could do something like this. Here I have my class shelf. It now has a concrete member function, not a template, that takes some concrete type, concrete callback type, F. And that concrete type has an operator paren paren that does something and inserts some indirection in there somehow, such that I can construct a concrete CB type object from any arbitrary lambda type. I don't pass the lambda, I use the lambda as the input to an implicit conversion, an implicit constructor of concrete CB type. It's the concrete CB type object that gets passed over to the other object file. And, and then the operator paren paren is going to do something that ends up invoking my lambda's call operator. We're gonna see after lunch how that works in my talk on type erasure. But this is where std function becomes useful. std function is a library type that implements type erasure such that my concrete CB type here might just be a std function of a certain signature. So that's the difference between a lambda and a std function. A std function is a concrete type that allows you to pass things across boundaries. Uh, the lambda type itself we've seen is this very simple, statically typed, no heap allocation, uh, no dynamic stuff going on at all, right? It's all nice and static. So lambdas are good. The function are some, some good, some bad. Do not come away from this thinking that if you use lambdas, you have to use std function. Right? You, can, you can very well use lambdas without necessarily having to pay for that type erasure. Um, you can also combine these two things, by the way. Th this would be something that you might see a standard library function doing. A uh, std threads constructor, I believe, does this. Uh, to the user, I say, I have a template for each book that can take anything you pass me. I don't mention that type erased callback type in my interface. I say, whatever you take, any F at all, I will take it. And I, and I will do something with it that you don't have to know about. That's part of my implementation. But secretly, what I'm going to do inside is I'm going to type erase that lambda down to some concrete type and pass it off to the implementation, which can be declared in another file. Okay. So I might use this pattern if I wanted to uh, get that type erased type out of my interface. And again, we'll talk more about type erasure later. But with that, we're getting close to the end here, I think. Oh yeah, one more thing about lambdas. If you're gonna use lambdas with std function, eventually, you're gonna try to capture something inside a lambda that is not copyable. Here I have my lamb lambda. Auto lamb, this is a uh, instance of a lambda type. That type has one data member named P, whose type is unique putter of int. So there's a data member of type unique putter. Lambdas always follow the rule of zero, by the way, which means that if it contains a unique putter, it's not gonna be copyable, but it is gonna be movable. But since it's not, so here, here we show that it is movable. I can move the lambda, and that will null out the unique putter in, inside lamb. Now lamb two has the new ownership of that unique putter just as it would with a class type. Write this out again. Write it out in terms of class capital P plus. If you're ever confused with what Lambda's doing, write it out as a class. You, sh you should be able to see how it works. However, when I try to make a copy, I find that there is no copy constructor 
of this lambda type because it contains a move only data member. So a lambda type can be copyable, movable, or neither, depending as its captures are copyable, movable, or neither. Whereas std function, because of the way that they chose to design std function, std function can only hold things that are copyable because the std function itself is copyable. Therefore, there are some lambdas that can't be stored inside a std function, inside a standard std function. All right, if I try to take the uh, lambda, this move only lambda, and move it into a std function, I'm gonna get a whole cascade of errors that you're glad I'm not showing you uh, from deep inside the function implementation saying, uh, essentially, you can't put a move only lambda inside a function. So how do I fix that? Um, one thing that I think is really the best we can do for now is place that lambda on the heap and then share access to it from all the instances of, of std function. So um, I'm making it copyable by making a shared putter to it. And then you can copy that shared putter. And as long as you don't use the old one anymore, it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's a little trick if you have a lambda with move only state inside itself, if it captures a unique putter, if it captures a promise, if it captures a future, all these move only types in this 11 standard library, um, you can use this shared putter trick to still put them inside a, a std function and get type erasure that way. Um, the other solution is to use a move only function type. Folly function would be an example. Um, there is a proposal currently for C23 to introduce a std unique function that would be the same idea. You can write your own if you come to my talk after lunch. Um, I think every code base needs a move only function type. Um, so if you don't have one and you have a use for one, you know, if you just have one place that uses the, the shared putter hack, that's fine. Um, but, uh, if you find yourself doing a lot, come to my talk and write your own unique function. And with that, we have about eight minutes left for questions, and thank you for coming. <laughs>